from stagnation to deflation. What now for Europe's economy? In the interview, the president of the German Institute for Economic Research, Marcel Fratscher. Mr. Fratscher, some experts say there's a shadow looming over Europe, the shadow of deflation. Does deflation really pose a threat for Europe? Yes, it does, uh, and for two reasons. One is um, deflation is already a reality for many companies in Europe. Um, if you look at the index number, we have 0.5, 0.6% inflation. It sounds like prices are still rising, but there are, there's a whole distribution around it. And what this number means is that about one third of the prices of goods and services in countries like Spain, Italy and France are already falling. And this means for a lot of companies in these countries, and also for more and more companies in Germany, falling prices in their own, for their own sector, for their own products, is already a reality. Um, at the same time, you have to realize um, we still have this positive overall development in prices, a slight rise of 0.5, 0.6%. But the risk of all prices, or most prices, falling, the index becoming negative, is rising and the number of international organizations estimate that this probability could be as high as 30 or 40 percent. Um, it's not a huge probability but given that the cost of a deflation are enormous for the economy we should really take this probability uh, of having an outright deflation with the overall index falling very seriously um, and also we should counteract that development we should really buy insurance against such a scenario and I think this is one of the key challenges for economic policy in Europe at the moment. But falling prices, that sounds good news for consumers, isn't it? Yes and no at the same time. It's, it's good news for consumers because they can buy certain products, they can buy a, a sofa or a flat screen TV or food uh, more cheaply, uh, this is true. Um, but this is a very short term perspective. Um, because if you take the company's perspective, if you're an entrepreneur and you're producing a particular good and you have to pay inputs, you have to pay wages today for a product that you can produce or sell in a year's or two years' time, but you can get less money for it in the future, this will mean for you as a company, as an entrepreneur, that you will invest less, that you will produce less, because it's less profitable and more uncertain. Uh, if you do that, you hire less people, you pay lower wages, uh, and this then means for the consumer that there is less employment, lower wages, lower income, mm -hmm. and clearly at the end of the day, having economic growth, having high employment, having high income growth, that should be more important uh, than giving a short-term relief to, mm -hmm. to consumers. Mm -hmm. So how is the current economic situation in the Eurozone? Is it still very fragile? Yes, we have a very fragile recovery in the euro area. We have positive growth figures in most euro area countries since the end of last year, but very low. Um, at the same time, we must not forget that economies such as Italy's or Spain's still are to date about 10% smaller than what they used to be in early 2008. So they have shrunk enormously uh, and that means we have in those economies a huge amount of potential in the economy that is not being used. Very high unemployment rate, a lot of people being without jobs. Um, and that shows the magnitude of the challenge we have in a lot of European economies at the moment. Um, and getting out of this very deep slump, having strong growth rates that generate employment, generate income, that is a key challenge and um, we, we are far away from generating that growth at the moment. Mm. Now the European Central Bank has lowered the key interest rate to historical low. Was that the right step? It was a dangerous, it was a risky, it was also a courageous step, but ultimately I believe it was the right decision to take. It was a necessary decision. Uh, it was a right decision because the ECB's main mandate is price stability and clearly the ECB is missing its mandate at the moment by a big margin. Mm. Uh, and all the projections say it will continue missing that, project, uh, that, that mandate for the next two, three, four years. So if the ECB takes its mandate seriously, it has to act. It has to do a monetary policy to counteract that deflationary pressure. Um, it was also the right decision 
because the second big challenge for the ECB is that its monetary policy, the, the money it gives to banks, does not reach its final purpose, namely companies and households, in particular in Southern Europe. Um, and so the ECB is trying through, by giving more liquidity, to reach those companies and households in a better way. Uh, but for that purpose, the reduction in interest rates is actually relatively unimportant because it was a very minor step. What is much more important is the amount of credit through its new program, the Teltra program, to really try to get more money to companies and households mm -hmm. in Southern Europe. So from that perspective, uh, it, it's that intention, but at the same time, of course, we have to be aware of the risks, uh, the risk of uh, that liquidity generating a, a bubble in financial markets, mm -hmm. making it much harder for consumers to, to save, for savers to, to build up uh, wealth, um, and also for a number of financial institutions to, to be profitable. So there are important risks, but ultimately, I think it was a necessary step for the ECB to take. But is liquidity in the market really the problem? Because banks make their own risk assessment. That's not a question of liquidity, you know. There is enough money, economists say. Absolutely. Banks have a lot of money, a lot of liquidity they have been getting from the European Central but they, Bank. But they don't give it further. They don't give it out yes. to lenders. The, the two problems is, on the one hand, companies don't demand so many loans. But at the same time, we also have still a major problem with the number of European banks, in particular in the crisis countries. They still have to reduce risk in their balance sheet. They still have to build up equity capital. Um, they still have to uh, find a business model in some cases to have a sustainable model in the long term. Uh, and here is a major challenge. Uh, and this problem the ECB will not be able to solve. We really need to tackle the banking problem in Europe. So does the ECB really have the right tools from your point of view to solve these kind of problems you were just mentioning? Uh, the ECB can only do its part uh, in solving the problem and this is to provide as much liquidity as possible against good collateral to banks in order for them to pass it on. Um, but clearly now it's really the political side that has to act, has to close down banks that are not solvent, has to recapitalize banks, has to really have a much stronger consolidation of the banking sector in Europe, in particular in the crisis countries in Southern Europe. So the ball is really in the court of the policymakers of politics in Europe. It's not in the court of the ECB. The ECB really has done pretty much all or almost all it can do. Uh, it's now the responsibility of the political side really to take action. So what kind of structural problems does the Eurozone still have? We have a structural problem in a lot of the crisis countries that they need to have a change in the structure of the economy. Look at Spain, which is a huge real estate sector before the crisis. We need to basically find jobs of these people who lost their jobs in this area in other sectors. Um, that means crisis countries need to develop a new economic structure, need to find sectors where they can export, they can be competitive in global markets. Um, we need to solve a number of issues on the European level. Banking uh, is one issue. We need to have a more efficient, a better functioning banking sector in Europe overall. We need to have more coordination on fiscal policy. Governments need to stick to, to rules. Mm. That is very important to regain confidence in financial markets, among companies, among households. Also here we need more cooperation and a closer coordination of policy. But have you seen any progress in these matters? <laughs> we have seen a little progress. We have seen a bit on fiscal policy. We have a two-pack, a six-pack, a fiscal yeah. compact in Europe. But in my view, it is too little. Because if a country still doesn't want to stick to the rules, yeah. there's no way for other Europeans to really make it binding. So we have a lack of binding rules. I believe we, we need to have a fiscal insolvency mechanism so that also governments in the future can become bankrupt. So this is important because financial markets then would really discipline governments much more strongly. At the moment they don't do that. Uh, so there are a number of reforms that are missing uh, and we need to implement. Mm -hmm. For many people, lower interest rates means a direct financial loss. So what should people do with their money? As a general rule, uh, you should always diversify your savings. You should never put all eggs in one basket. You should always diversify. And that means you should, of course, 
have a saving account, but you should also think of investing in small share in equities. You should think of maybe investing abroad because you diversify also globally and also real estate, at least in some countries like Germany at the moment, is attractive. So diversification is the answer. And clearly you need to, to think long term. In the short term equities are risky, but in the long term we know from all studies that um, investing in equities actually is a sensible strategy as part of an overall savings strategy. Now despite the low interest rates, the euro is fairly strong. Is that a problem? I think it's a minor problem. A lot of European politicians make it into a big story and say it's because of the strong euro that uh, our companies cannot export and we cannot grow as an economy. I think it's an excuse. I think the euro has made a scapegoat for the own failings in uh, policy making in those countries. Clearly the euro is probably a bit too strong at the moment. It could be 5%, 10% weaker. Um, but the problem that we have in many European economies is not that the euro is too strong, but is that we have a lack of structural reforms, that we don't have enough flexibility in those economies, um, that we don't have the right policies, right regulation, right incentives from the government side, that we have still a fiscal policy that is not sustainable. So that's where the main problems lie. It's not the euro. It's easy for politicians to blame that because they can say, I have nothing to do with it. Uh, but uh, as a general piece of advice that we as economists should give to policymakers is focus on those reforms you can do, focus on structural reforms, get your economy to gain competitiveness um, and the euro is really the least of our problems at the moment. Okay. So lots needs to be done. Thank you very much for these insights. Thank you.